ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರವಾಹೇತಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾಷಾವಹೈ During this weekend, we are going to study the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which chapter is called the Bhakti Yoga. Meaning, the title of the chapter of the subject matter is Bhakti Devotion. Bhakti means devotion, devotion to the Lord. In fact, Bhakti, the devotion is the subject matter not only of the 12th chapter of the Gita but in fact the chapters beginning from the 7th up to the 12th the 18 chapters of the Bhagavad Gita can generally be divided into three broad sections consisting of six chapters each and one may say that the subject matter of the first six chapters is karma the action the subject matter of the middle six chapters is bhakti devotion and the subject matter of the last six chapters is gnanam is knowledge broadly or one can also say that the subject matter of the first six chapters is the self the subject matter of the second six chapters from 7th to 12th is god and the creation and the subject matter of the last six chapters is the identity the oneness between the individual and god individual and the total so this is how the the arrangement of bhagavad gita is looked at and therefore bhakti or the devotion has been the subject matter of the chapters beginning from chapter 7 concluding with this chapter 12 therefore to understand this 12th chapter we should have a certain understanding of what has gone by in the previous chapters at least beginning from chapter 7 from chapter 7 lord krishna started talking about god so who is god because god has a very important place in our life if we, each one of us has a certain understanding or a conclusion about god and knowingly or unknowingly that conclusion plays a very important role in our life whatever we do taitriya upanishad says asan neva sabhavati asad brahme divede chet asti brahme chet veda santamenam tato viduriti upanishad says that one who believes that there is no god there is one who does not accept the existence of god in one's life that person becomes as good as non existent on the other hand one who accepts existence of god his life also they say that he really lives that means his life really is meaningful <coughs> why is it so well many people tell me sometimes people tell me swami ji i don't believe in god recently i just met a person who says swami i am an atheist so i went to ram krishna mission school for a number of years and then he was a, he was perhaps a devoted person and later on he said i became an atheist i said what do you mean by atheist he says i don't believe in god what kind of god god in terms of personality So when this person says i do not believe in god but if they do not believe in god of a certain concept so why why what's the problem in believing god and accepting god he says if god has created this world then why should it be like this why should this thing happen why should that thing happen i said you believe in god if he makes a creation which is confirming to your likes and dislikes 
And because the things are not quite in keeping with the way we would like to see them, therefore you say that there is no God. But how do you know that if the universe or the world was exactly as you wanted it to be, how do you know that it would necessarily be right? Because when we keep on ordering things as to how they should be, it is based on our very limited understanding of what is right and what is proper. But we should accept that we are beings having tremendous limitations, limitations of knowledge, limitations of understanding. And therefore, with that limited knowledge and understanding, when I order as to how things should be, there is no way of saying that that would be the right thing. As Swami Dayanandi often says, I was thinking about this creation of God and wondering whether I can bring about some improvement or not. (laughs) That's the point. If I can bring about an improvement in this creation, then I can say that perhaps the creation is incomplete or imperfect. So I thought about it. And you heard this story, you know. But then, what improvement can I bring? Then Swami came with a very bright idea. That looks like the nose, the way it is in place on this body, this is not in the right place. I think we can make an improvement, perhaps we can find a better location for the nose. Because nose being here seems to create a lot of problems when somebody sneezes and all those bacteria enter my nose. And that's how, uh, so all this cold and allergies all they come to me. And when somebody smoking, the smoke also enters my nose. So why not we place the nose on the top of the head, maybe that would be a better place. So that if somebody smokes, then also the smoke goes up in the chimney and I have nothing to worry about. So like that, Swami felt very good about having come up with this wonderful idea that yes, I can bring about an improvement in the creation of God. Until a day came when Swamiji was visiting somewhere and then they were offering tea and coffee and whatever and Swamiji was asked to choose, Swamiji take one. But you know, unfortunately in India, and when you come to Gujarat for example, you see no difference between tea and coffee, at least apparently. (laughs) Because they will take water and milk and tea and coffee powder and boil it and spice it and whatever it is. And the only way to de- determine whether it is tea or coffee is really to take that cup and perhaps smell it, that's all. Until then you can't determine. So then Swami you thought, suppose the nose is right on the top, then how am I going to smell this coffee? Unless I pour that coffee in my nose or something like that. And that when I eat the food, how can I enjoy that flavor? How do I know what that food it is that I am eating? Because sometimes the way we pre- prepare vegetables, etc., you never know what is the original substance anyway. So then with all this, again Swami came to the conclusion that the nose, being where it is, is in the right place. And so, anyway the point is that this belief in God is a very important thing in our life. Santamenam tato vidurti One who says that there is God, his life also becomes meaningful. Sat meaning he really lives, he really exists. Because when I say that I accept God, it doesn't mean that I give lip service to God. So much I believe in God, I accept God. I think God is. What makes you think God is? Oh, because, you know, Whatever I want, God seems to be giving me. <laughs> so see, my, my son got admission to medical school. I wanted this contract, I got it. And whatever. And thus, uh, the, even the belief about the God also comes because of, uh, or, or acceptance of God comes because some of my likes and dislikes are satisfied. But suppose then God fails to do what I want him to do, then perhaps that belief also will be shaken up. So it is not that when I say I believe in God, that I just give him lip service or because God obliges me or favors me in every way, that my belief of God has come. But that belief of God should come from a certain understanding of God. 
And when that understanding is there, then our life also becomes meaningful. If that understanding is based on a certain mature, uh, you know, that understanding is based on certain maturity, which comes from the scriptures. So, sneha bhakti hi That's sneha. The affection for God is called bhakti, the devotion. Which affection or the love is, is, is based on something. Mahatma jnana purvastu. By listening to the glories of the Lord. Mahatma means the greatness. By knowing the greatness. So love that arises for anybody also by knowing their greatness, there is going to be a lasting love. Sudrudha sarvatodhikaha sneha. Sneha. Sneha means affection. Sneha means something that joins me, something that binds me, connects me. That sneha, the attachment, that love, the devotion to Lord, the account of knowing his greatness. Sudrudha. And that sneha, the love that is sudrudha, which is firm, not to be shaken by some events in the life, Sarvatodhikaha and the sneha of the attachment of the affection that is greater than the affection I have for anything else. That is called bhaktihi, that is called the devotion. Yaya muktir nachanyasa. And that bhakti of the devotion of the Lord is a means of mukti, is a means of liberation. That one can gain that freedom one that, that is one is seeking in life only when this devotion is there. <coughs> And that's the reason why in these chapters, from 7th to 12th, particularly from 7th to 11th, Lord Krishna describes his Mahatma, describes his glories, describes his greatness. And, and the reverence that is going to be lasting reverence, lasting affection, lasting devotion, because it is not arisen merely from some experiences that I have in my life, but from understanding of life that I have. Lord Krishna says in the seventh chapter, Mattah parataram nanyat kinchidasti dhananja mai saram idam prodam sutre maniganaiva. Hey Arjuna, in this universe there is nothing other than me. All there is is I alone. As Swami Dayananji says often, that Hindus, not only Hindus believe in one God. Because very often people feel that Hindus believe in many gods. How many gods do you have? And every god seems to be different from every other god. And therefore it is said, not only that Hindus believe in only one god, but that Hindus believe in only god. Mattah parataram nanyat kinchidasti dhananjaya. He dhananjaya, he Arjuna, there is nothing other than me. Whatever you see is nothing but myself. Lord, what do you mean? Everything is you? Yes. Ye chaiva sattvika bhavaha, rajasaha, tamasas chaye, matta evaditan vidhi. Whatever in this world that is sattvic, whatever there is that is rajas, whatever there is that is tamas. See, this world can be understood as sattvic, rajas and tamas. Those which are born of sattva, those things that are born of rajas and those things that are born of tamas. That which is born of sattva, is pure, is transparent, is tranquil, is, you know, is, is auspicious, is sacred. That is born of rajas, is active, activity, agitation, that is the, 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 the attribute of rajas. And those things that are born of tamas, they are dark, dull. So, dirty, all of these are the expressions of tamas. The greed and passion and agitation, etc., are the expressions of rajas. And tranquility, purity, they are all the expressions of sattva. We find these kind of expressions in life. Whatever we come across can be classified as one of these three. No doubt everything is changing and therefore nothing can be said to be sattva all the time, nothing to be said to be rajas all the time. 
But any given time, it is sattva, rajas, or tamas, or a combination of these three, that is what we come across, and therefore we can say that the life is nothing but a product of the combination of these three, sattva, rajas, and tamas. Thus we see beauty and the glory and goodness in life, plenty of it. We also see at the same time, lot of illness, badness, cruelty, lot of, you know, lot of evil things also we see in the life. Lord Krishna has no problem with that. Whatever is divine, that also is my expression. Whatever is devil or whatever is evil, also is nothing but my expression. Lord Krishna is bold enough to say that. Ye chaiva sattvika bhavaha, rajasas tamasas chaye matte veditan vidhi. So whatever you find with sattvik, whatever you find with rajas, whatever you find with tamas, understand that all of them are my expression. All these different ways. Lord, does it mean that you are, that means when we see cruelty, that means that you are doing it? Swamiji, when murder is taking place, God is murdering somebody. When stealing takes place, God is stealing something. He says, yes, I am doing everything. How can there be God like that? Only thing that he reminds us, that I alone am everything. That means the one who is shooting also is myself, and one who is shot at also is myself. If one who is shooting is God, and one who is shot at is not God, then there is a definitely a problem. How can, you, how can you create a world like this? When somebody is happy, somebody is unhappy, somebody is wealthy, somebody is poor, if this diversity or disparity, then of course we have to question God as to how can you create like this. And that's the reason why everybody has problem with God. <coughs> Where God is presented merely as the creator, as what we call the nivitta karanam, as what we call the intelligent cause. That way the creator is separate from the creation. Like a pot maker being separate from a pot, and similarly also God, who is a creator from creation. If this is the concept of God, then there will be a lot of questions, which cannot be answered. But here God, Lord Krishna says, not only I am the part maker, but I am the part also. Then it's all fine. Then, if the, you see, otherwise the part is not him, then when he makes a beautiful part, we say, look, he is partial. When he makes an ugly part, we say that he is again partial, he is cruel. In that case, partiality, cruelty, all of these will be the attributes of the Creator. But here, the beautiful part also is himself, the ugly part also is himself, then he can say that, I am assuming the role of a beautiful part, now I assume the role of an ugly what is ugly? Ultimately we will find that all of these are certain concepts that we have, in reality all that is just clay, and similarly also, that means that, that clay takes different forms, we call beautiful parts, ugly parts, and whatever we say. Because of reality is nothing but clay, and similarly also, the only reality that there is in life is this God. Everything else is merely an appearance, one God appearing in many forms. That provides a variety, that provides a diversity. But not understanding this, taking merely the diversity and disparity as real, then we have a lot of problems in our life. Because the duality, the disparity, all that obtains at the superficial level, at a given level, is taken to the ultimate reality. Not recognizing that there is a unity in and through this diversity. And so Lord Krishna says, Mai Saravidam Protam Sutre Mani Ganaiva. Just as in a sutra, just as in thread, there are many pearls that are threaded in, like in a garland of fl flowers, there is a thread in which different flowers are threaded in, and just as the thread is a support of all those flowers, similarly also Krishna says that the whole universe, consisting of the names and forms, consisting of this diversity and disparities, all of that is in fact threaded into me. I am the support of all of them. Just as if the thread were not there, how the spurs would scatter away. And similarly also, had I not been there in the universe, everything would scatter away. But we find that just as the pearls are, they obtain 
in the harmony that is what we call the necklace and similarly also there is a harmony in this universe there is an order in the universe it may not appear to us perhaps if we or if we feel that order should only be in a given way then perhaps we may not find the order but if we give up those insistences if we give up those demands or our likes and dislikes as to how things should be and then i look at the life perhaps i may have a different perception about life it is difficult no doubt for me to give up my demands i admit that it is not easy for me to give up the demands as to how things should be because i wish that all of that should be conducive or agreeable to me the other what what is agreeable and what is disagreeable and i would always order that the world should be agreeable to me which god is willing to oblige really he says fine have it your way except that after five minutes i turn around and say no not this way give me that way and he gives me that after 10 minutes again i turn around and want it differently and that's why myself fine how my ideas of what is desirable what is undesirable what is agreeable what is disagreeable all of them are constantly changing even god also cannot keep up with me <coughs> but it is human to desire that there's nothing you know i mean we can't fault ourselves because we desire that the world should be agreeable to us it is human so why should it happen to me and it is human it's understandable and that we pray to the lord that let the let everything be agreeable to me it is quite fair nothing wrong in it but at the same time if we are able to create a distance with our own desires with our own likes and dislikes for the time being and then look at the creation perhaps we may have a different perception about the creation and we may feel that there is a certain order that there is something that informs everything there is something that connects everything and that's the reason why often we find the description of the universe this this creation described as as body as god embodiment of god so god manifest as a, we have a him called purusha suktam purusha suktam is describing and vers- and and and, and, and uh, glorifying the lord in the form of a person so whole universe is looked upon as a person and just as a person like you and i have various limbs so various sense organs and various limbs and similarly also this universe is a person the god personified and having different limbs and so it is said the heavens is the head of the god and the space intermediate is his middle body that the air is his breath the sun and moon are his eyes the directions are his ears in this way they describe this whole universe as the person not that we are to take these things literally but the idea is that just as i am an organic whole even though i as an individual consists of different limbs each one being different from the other so hands and legs and hair and all of these limbs are different from one another names different functions different places there is a, you know there is nothing that is there is similar not even two cells perhaps are similar to each other and thus there is diversity in every way and still there is a unity because there is one spirit that informs the whole body and that's the reason why the head also i call i and the toe also i call i and every cell i call i because there is one spirit one self that seems to inform the whole being that can be said to be a thread every cell in my body and that spirit that consciousness the i that informs all these you know the limbs and all the different parts of my body can be considered or equivalent to a thread that informs it and that's what provides that unity or oneness in and through the diversity no doubt some parts of my body can be said to be ugly some parts can be said to be beautiful depending on what my idea of ugliness and beauty is of course i think everything about my body is beautiful you will perhaps think about other bodies you know can be ugly but as i say if i how things should be and if i am willing to appreciate as the things are that is called objectivity that is called the freedom from likes and dislikes that's called the freedom from demands 
and the willingness to appreciate the way things are, then I will be able to see a certain order, a certain harmony, a certain beauty, maybe goodness, maybe divinity. Whatever be my concept of God, what I want to see is God. So many God must be divine, God must be good, God must be beautiful, God must be love, God must be truth. That's what I be, that kind of God I believe in. I'll be able to see that God everywhere if I should be. When I say beauty, means I have a certain idea about what that beauty must be. And therefore to me, this is not beautiful, that is beautiful. Even when I talk about truth, I may have own idea of what truth is and what it is not. Then so, if I want to see God, that is, if I define God as truth, if I define God as beauty, if I define God as goodness, it's quite alright. Lord Krishna says, that is all there is. In the, in the, uh, you know, in the essence of everything, in the womb of everything, all there is nothing but goodness. Nothing but divinity, nothing but beauty, nothing but love, in the co- as a core, in the core of everything, as a core of everything, as that which supports everything, that is the substratum of everything. To see that, of course, what is required is that I give up my ideas of how things should be, and I am just available to appreciate the way things are, including my own self. In order that we can see that beauty Lord Krishna describes in all these various chapters, it's Rasoham of Sukhaunteya, Prabhasmi Shashi Surya Yoho, Pranavas Sarvavedeshu, Shabdakhe Paurusham Rushu. Hey Arjuna, I am, I am the taste in the water, I am the smell in the earth, I am the sound in the space, I am the touch in the air, I am the heat in the fire, I am the light in the sun and moon, I am the intelligence, of, I am the intellect of the intelligence, I am the strength of the strong, I am the brilliance of the brilliant, I am everything. So in the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna describes His glories. Here Arjuna, I am the, I am the father of the whole universe, I am the mother, I am the grandfather, I am the great grandfather of this universe. But if he is father, then we ask him, who is mother? Pita ham asse jagata hai. I am asse jagata hai. Pita, I am the father of this creation. The Lord, who is the mother? Mata, mother also I am. Then the question that children often ask, if God created this world, then who created him? So he says, Pita maha, the grandfather also I am. Mata, dhata, pita maha. Gatir Bharta, Prabhusakshi, Nivasa, Sharanam, Surata. I am the dwelling place of the whole universe. From me there is a, there is a creation of the universe. By me there is sustenance of the universe. By into me the whole universe ultimately merges back. Aham Krishna se jagadaha, Prabhavaha, Pralayastatha. I am the Prabhava. I am the source of the whole universe. Pralayaha, I am the, I am that in which the whole universe, that from which the whole universe emerges and merges back and is sustained into me. This very beautiful vision of God, Lord Krishna provides. And wherever he gets an opportunity in the Bhagavad Gita, he does not, I mean he always glorifies himself. He sings his glories. Thank God that he sings his glories not as an individual, he sings his glories as a universal being. And that is now a person, Krishna. And then when he claims all of this, we may have a problem with that. Somebody may have a problem with that. But no, he doesn't talk as person, as Swami, Mr. Krishna, he doesn't talk that way. He talks as a principle that Krishna is. Even the word Krishna, the name Krishna also, Krishna. He is explained as, as derived from two elements, Krish and Na. Krishi bhu vachaka shabda hai, nasya nirvruti vachaka hai. Krish is in the sense of existence. In the sense of that which imparts existence to things, satta. And so Krish means existence, and means ananda or happiness. And therefore, sadananda, tayoraikyam sadananda. Krishna means sadananda, the happiness, eternal happiness. So Krishna itself means that which attracts everybody, that which is embodiment of love, that is embodiment of joy. In that sense, Lord Krishna says, 
sustain, by me it is sustained, and to me it all goes back. And who is that me? Is nothing but love. That's what Lord Krishna is. If you want to give a form to joy, you know, that would be Lord Krishna. If you want to give form to love, perhaps that would be Lord Krishna. Is it not so? And so from that love, from the joy, from the fullness, the whole universe has arisen. By that it is sustained, and to that it goes back. So that is all there is. That is the material cause. So Lord Krishna presents himself as not merely the creator, as not merely the intelligent cause, but also the creation as the material cause, as the very substance from which the whole universe is made. And so love is substance from which everything is formed. Can you believe that? Love or happiness from which everything is formed. And in order for us to see that, what is required is to step back from our preconceived notions of how things should be. Of course those notions of how things should be arise from the notions of who I am. Since I have notions about who I am, therefore I also have notions about how the world is. Since I have notions about how I should be, therefore... And from the teaching of Bhagavad Gita, first thing that we have to do is to step, step back from these conclusions and notions about myself as well as about the universe. And then we can appreciate what Lord Krishna says. <coughs> so that is how the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna in these three, in these six chapters describes God, describes also devotees and describes the devotion. That is subject matter of the middle six chapters of Bhagavad Gita. God, devotee and devotion. He also describes his devotees in the seventh chapter, in the ninth chapter, in, in all these chapters. Chatur Vidha Bhajante Maam Janaha Sukritan Arjuna Arto Jignya Surarthasi Jnani Che Bharadarshabha Hey Bharadarshabha, hey Arjuna. My devotees is fourfold are my devotees. They are the people of virtuous actions. Who can become a devotee of God? Well, each one is a devotee of God. Each one of us is a devotee, born devotee. So devotion is not something that we have to acquire. It's something that we have to discover in ourselves. Then each one is born a bhakta or a devotee. And really speaking, each one of us worships only God, knowingly or unknowingly. Most people worship God unknowingly, some people worship Him knowingly. I may not worship God in, in that sense perhaps or with that, using that word, but I am a worshipper all the time because I am a seeker. I am seeking something. You ask Him, what is it that you want in life? He will say, I want happiness. Ask Him, how much happiness do you want? How much happiness do you want? All the happiness that I can. Boundless happiness is what I want. I know I'm not going to get it. If I had my way, then I want boundless happiness. Not even a trace of unhappiness in there. How long do you want to be happy? If I had my way. I know it's not doesn't happen, but if I had my way all the time, at all the places, under all conditions, if I had my way, I should not have a moment of unhappiness, not an experience of unhappiness. All that I love and want is happiness, and that is what I have been seeking in my life. I am a seeker since my birth, and seeking happiness such as that. And thus, when we, are, when we analyze what it is that I am seeking, that sukham, what kind of happiness, not limited in time because I want to be happy at all the times, not limited in place because I want to be happy in all the places and not limited in condition because I want to be happy under all conditions. That means I am seeking happiness not limited by time, place or conditions. Putting it another way, I want happiness at all the times. Happiness that does not die, that is called Sat, which ever exists. But I, so we say that you are happy. Do you know that you are very happy or you are enjoying that kind of happiness when you are fast asleep? Do you know that you are happy? Maybe I am, but I am not satisfied with it because I want happiness and I am going to be aware of that happiness also. 
I want to be awarefully happy. I want that along with the happiness or ananda, I want awareness. I want chit. I also want knowledge. And what kind of ananda? That does not go away. And that can be only when it is not created. What is created? Happiness should not go away. That means I am seeking happiness that is also uncreated. That's called sat. And there was sat, chit and ananda. This is what I am seeking. That is what we call God. Satyam jnana manantam brahma. That's called God. Who is satyam jnana manantam. Who is existence? Who is intelligence? Who is limitless? Who is wholeness? That is called Brahman. That is called God. And therefore, when we analyze what it is that we are seeking in life, we realize that each one of us is seeking that God. If God is understood to be a certain person or personality, then we would have differences. But really speaking, when they give various forms to us for worship, each form is only nothing but manifestation of that Satchidananda. How to relate to that Satchidananda? What the Vedic culture does by giving us different forms of worship is to help us establish a relationship with God. Because it is necessary to establish a relationship, then alone I can worship Him for worshipping or for doing anything. Even to express my love, a relationship is necessary. And my love is expressed depending upon as father, as whatever. As my spouse, as my child, as my, you know. So that relationship is necessary for the invoking of love. Similarly also for invoking love from my heart, it is necessary to have a relationship with God. That relationship is very important. And that's the reason why various forms of relationships are given to us. Depending upon my emotional being, that I am, I, I, I wish to worship God as father, fine. I want to worship God as son, I want to worship God as friend, I want to worship God as my, as my master. In all these different ways I can worship God depending upon how I want to relate to him. And that is why different forms are given to us so that we can establish a relationship with God. And that relationship becomes a lasting relationship. God is everything for us. Mata Ramo Mat Pita Rama Chandra hai. Swami Ramo Mat Sakha Rama Chandra hai. The devotees of Rama say, Mata Rama, hai. Rama is my mother. Pita Rama Chandra hai. Rama Chandra is my father. Swami Ramo, Rama is my Swami, my master. Mat Sakha Rama Chandra hai. Rama Chandra, Rama is my Sakha, my friend. Sarvaswam me Rama Chandra hai. Everything is Rama Chandra. That's what you want ultimately. But to begin with, I look upon Rama or God as father, or as mother, or as brother, or as friend, as however I feel like. And so Hanumanji would relate to Rama as master, a Lakshmana would relate to him as brother, a Sita would relate to him as husband, a Dasharatha would relate to him as son, a Sugriva would relate to him as friend, a Ravana would relate to him as an enemy. We wish, we want to avoid that kind of relationship with God anyway. But some bhaktas chose that way. They found it to be easier path. Because when these two gatekeepers of Lord Narayana, when they were cursed that they will have to go to earth or they will have to suffer. Because this Jaya and Vijaya, both of them are the, the gatekeepers, doorkeepers of Lord Narayana. And at one point, Lord Narayana told them not to allow anybody. And so, these are all very faithful and obedient servants. And some sages happened to come at that time to meet God and these people said, nobody can go in. They just followed the order to the letter. And the sages cursed them, so how dare you stop us? And they were cursed to suffer. Then they went to the slaughter. Because you followed the instruction in letter, but not in spirit. Sometimes the people who serve God or whoever they serve, sometimes they become so, you know, I mean, uh, insistent upon how the serving should be that 
they even forget the person whom they are serving as to what he would want. So Lord told him, look, don't you know that Go Brahmana Hitayacha, I am the one who always, uh, to in whose heart, these Brahmanas are very dear in my heart. And these Brahmanas have come to see me, you should have known, what would I do if I were in your place? I would definitely have welcomed them. But in your arrogance that you are the servants of God, therefore you did not even think of how I would treat them, and thus you treated them in an arrogant way. It is the arrogance for which you are cursed. And of course you are my devotees and therefore you will be saved, but then you have choices. Either you will be born on this earth as happy people, but then we will we'll come back here after a long time, after a number of births. Or you can be born as evil beings and then you can come to me quickly. What do you want? <laughs> then they said that, one Lord, we want to come back to you quickly and therefore maybe you born as evil beings. And that's how this Jaya and Vijaya, the gatekeepers of Lord, the things that we ever see in our Puranas, as the Rakshasas, as demons they were born. And therefore, they all the time related to God as enemies. And enemy also thinks of the enemy all the time. That comes, uh, you know, enemy of Krishna, all the time thought of Krishna, how to kill him. Oh, Ravana all the time thought of Rama. In a, some ways they thought of God all anyway. They say that in which we don't want to think that way. But anyway, they also got liberated. The idea is that there are those who relate to God as enemies. Some relationship is required. And that is why different forms are given to us, different images are given to us. Idea is to be able to relate to God. Because when there is a relationship, then that feeling in my heart is invoked. This is not so. It's when I'm in front. Oh, when I'm in, when I'm with my child, then the father in me gets invoked. So that is why there's different forms and different methods of worship. What Swamiji, what amount of ritualism? Most complex religion is this Hinduism. Why rich rituals means what? How complicated, how many kinds of rituals and how complicated they are. But then rituals are always complicated. It is not so time. After the class is over, everybody will go to dining hall, follow a ritual of eating breakfast. Everybody is a ritual. Everybody wants a toast of a certain kind. I mean, I want a bagel and I want a toasted bagel. Toasted only this much and that much. And I want cream cheese. Somebody wants butter. Somebody wants without anything. Somebody wants jam, whatever it is, if it is there. Some, in the coffee also there is a ritual. What kind of a coffee I want? Everybody has their own taste. I mean, don't you follow these rituals? I wake up in the morning, I follow a lot of rituals, starting from brushing my teeth, lots of rituals. I do it in a certain way. Everything is in a, done in a certain way. Is it not so? And when our children don't do this, they the sloppy fellows do it, you know, we train them. <laughs> that there is always a way of doing something. That there is a way of relating also. There is a way of expressing my, expressing my affection, my feeling. That's why the rituals are given to us, a way of expressing our feelings. Ways become just nothing but, you know, become a lot of uh, notion, I mean, a lot of motions and gestures. But the feeling were there, well, all of them would be provide us the vehicle of expression of feelings. So, as I said, each one of us is born a devotee of God. Each one of us wants only Satchidananda, nothing else we want in our life, nothing else. And then we cannot settle for anything else. Siddhartha would tell us, if I cannot achieve that goal in this lifetime, I'll continue that pursuit in the next lifetime, in another embodiment, because unless that com pursuit is complete, I cannot, I ca cannot be, I cannot relax. That's how we accept the concept of these repeated births and deaths. So understand that each one of us is devotee of God. That such is Anand that I am seeking, where is it? That's all there is, Lord Krishna says. That's all there is. And therefore, the Satchit Ananda is not something to be achieved, it's something to be discovered, it's something to be seen. This God is Swami Dhananda, he would say, God is, we don't have to believe in God. We have to understand God. Because all there is, is God alone. Therefore, 
he requires an understanding rather than a belief. And this explanation of what God is, is a beginning from 7th chapter of the Gita. So in the 7th and in the 9th chapter he described who he is, how he is. And we find in the description, two forms of description of God. One is with attributes, other is without the attributes. So this becomes another matter of contention. Do you believe in God with form or do you believe in God without form? Says God is, since everything is God therefore, all the forms also are God and therefore, you have no problem in accepting God with form. But we cannot say that that is the ultimate, that, that God is confined merely to form. That whatever form is, that is also the manifestation of God. We cannot say that God is confined to a given form. Because for one to be able to appear in many forms, that must be without the form, is it not so? For an actor to now become a beggar and then to become a king and then to become all these different things, he must be all of, different from all of them, is it not so? A beggar cannot become a king. But now this fellow becomes a beggar, then he becomes a king, then he becomes all these different things. That shows that he is different from all of them. So in the ninth chapter, in the seventh and ninth chapter, Lord Krishna says, Machthani sarabhutani nachaham teshavastitaha. In seventh chapter, he says, Mai tesh uh, matte vetan vidi natvaham teshute mai. And this in the ninth chapter says, Machthani sarabhutani nachaham teshavastitaha. Here, Juna, understand this. All these things are in, all of these beings are in me, I am not in them. That means, I act as all of them. I appear as all of them. I appear as a every name and form in the universe. But I, they are not in me, meaning I am not confined to them. I am not really them. I am them and still not really them. Just as an actor would say that I am a beggar, but not really a beggar also. I am the king also, but not really a king also. That means the beggar and the king and all of these are what we call mithya, meaning their appearances. Similarly, the whole universe of names and forms, Lord Krishna says, I am manifest in the whole universe. But I am not limited to the universe. The universe of names and forms is a vehicle of my manifestation, is a, the costume that I put on. But who am I? I am the one that is without the costume in my true ultimate nature. So as Bhagavad Gita explains the principle of God, that he is both with attributes and without the attributes. So how can one be two? With attributes and without attributes looks like contradictory things. With form and without form looks like contradictory things. How can one be with form as well as without form? How can one be with attribute as well as without attribute? Like an actor who is a beggar as well as not a beggar. He is a king as well as not king. When we say that this fellow is a beggar also and not a beggar also, when we say that, when the two contradictory things are said about one, one being, one person, then it only means that one of them is right, other is false. One is satyam, other is mithya. Similarly also, we would say that, that Lord, who transcendental, who transcends every limitation, is the true or the ultimate or absolute nature of God. But then the one who appears in all these limited names and forms is the manifest expression of the same absolute God. Meaning the same absolute transcendental limitless God appears as though having assumed these various limitations assume these various forms and manifest in these different forms, names and forms. Sarvani bhutani vichitya dhiraha namani kritva abhivadan yadaste This dhiraha, the wise, the omniscient one, having created all the forms, then assumes the different forms. So this is the concept of God that is presented by Lord Krishna in these chapters. <coughs> And in tenth chapter, Arjuna requests him, Lord, please describe to me your glories. 
It is true that you described what your true nature is in the seventh chapter, in the eighth chapter, in the ninth chapter. But I find it is rather difficult for me to comprehend that. I find that I have not developed that purity of the mind, that objectivity that I can set apart, right now stand apart from all my notions and likes and dislikes. I do not seem to attain that purity of mind. And therefore, how can I worship you? How can it, how can it happen that I can, think, I can think of you all the time and I can worship you all the time and thus become free from my impurities? and then know you in your ultimate nature. How to do that? Keshu Keshu Jubhaveshu Chintyosi Bhagavan Maya In the 10th chapter, Arjuna requests Lord. Keshu Keshu Jubhaveshu In what various expressions, Lord, should I think of you? Vistarena Atmano Yogam Vihudim Chajanardana Bhuyah Kasa Please describe to me your glories, your greatness. Lord Krishna, that's what I've been describing. In 7th chapter, 8th chapter, 9th chapter, that's what I've been describing. My glories, my greatness, then what? Bhuyakata, please tell me again. Describe again. Vistanena Atmana Yogam Vihutim Chajanadana. Vistanena, describe in great detail. Look at Arjuna. What a beautiful now frame of mind Arjuna has. Remember that this teaching takes place in the middle of the battlefield. Where we can't even think of anything. What a tremendous amount of tension there must be. What an amount. It's a crisis situation where you can see people wielding weapons all around you. And the shots are about to be fired. And everyone is waiting for these two persons to finish the dialogue. So that they can get on with the business. In that kind of a tense situation, Arjuna seems to have forgotten everything. He is totally relaxed. He is not worried about anything. Vistarena Atmana Yogam Vibhutim Janardana Kathaya He Janardana Lord, you are the one to whom all the devotees come with all their prayers. It is your nature to fulfill the prayers of all the devotees. He Janardana Please tell me in detail Please describe to me in detail all your glories and greatness. As though he forgot where he's sitting. He forgot that he's in the middle of the battlefield. He forgot that he came here to fight this battle and to win the battle. He forgot anything. He's a blessed person. All that matters to him right now is God and nothing else. And so, Lord, please tell me what are your ways experience? manifestations. And thus in the 10th chapter, Lord Krishna describes what we call his vibhutis or glories or the greatness. That I am the whole universe, but right now it is difficult for me to see God in everything. I understand intellectually that God alone is everything because nothing else, you know, there, there can be anything else. But still Swami, when I look at my neighbor, there is no way I can find God in him. <laughs> and is my boss? No way. Even my spouse have a hard time seeing God. <laughs> so Lord Krishna says, okay. So he describes his beautiful expressions. Sthavaranam Himalaya hai. I mean Himalaya among all the mountains. Srota Samasmi Janavi. I am the Ganges among all the rivers. All the rivers I am, Arjuna, but if in all the rivers you cannot see me, at least in the Ganges, no problem, yes. All the mountains I am, but if you cannot see me in all the mountains, I am the Himalaya among all the mountains. Ashwatha Saravaksha, all the trees I am. If I cannot see, if you cannot see God in all the trees, in Ashwatha tree, at least I am the Ashwatha. That particular people tree among all the trees. Among all the sages, Maharshi Nam, Bhruguraham, among all the sages, I am Maharshi. Devarshinam, Chanardha, among all the divine sages, I am Narada. Prahladas, Chasmi, Daityanam, even these Daityas, even the demons also I am. Lord, you are these demons? I can't see you in, in them. Prahladas, Chasmi, Daityanam, among the demons, I am Prahlada. Who does not have any kind of hesitation of, of, of declaring who he is. 
He even says that I am the one, I am the, among the, those who cheat, I am the, I am the, I am, you know, the champion of cheating. So, dhyutam chalayatam asmi, of all those who cheat, I am dhyutam, the game of dice I am. <coughs> and so, everything that is glorious, yad yad vibhuti masatvam shri madurjitameva, whatever is possessed of vibhuti, of glory, of power, of magnificence, Look at that is my expression. So the 10th chapter, in 10th in chapter, Lord Krishna describes his vibhutis. So, to give us a means of meditation, how can I meditate upon God with form? And ultimately, Lord Krishna says, suppose you know all my glory, so what? In fact, what do you see is just a fraction of what I am. What do you see is my immanent form, but I am the transcendent also. I am the self of the whole universe, the whole universe I am. If you see me only in a few things, that's not enough, I am the whole universe. Then Arjuna really got curious, Lord, you are the whole universe, you are the self of the whole universe, you are Vishwatma. Then will you please show me your, your cosmic form? I tell you, what an amount of freedom he feels, you can see. Once you really, you know the Lord, then you know what freedom you can take, what liberty you can take. Devotees take all kinds of liberties with God. We are all scared, you know, I mean of God, because He is omniscient, omnipotent and this and that. Devotees are not scared of Him at all. Arjuna is also not scared. And so, he takes the liberty of requesting God, O oh Lord, will you please show me your cosmic form? Saramita detha tattvam atmanam purushottama Trashtam ichhamite rupam I am desirous of seeing that form. Manyasayati tachakyam maya drashtam iti prabhu So Arjuna in the beginning of 11th chapter requests Lord to show his cosmic form. And then he realizes, hey, I made that request, but do I really deserve it? He realized nobody has dared to make this kind of a request to the Lord to show his cosmic form. Some people have been very fortunate in seeing their cosmic form, very few of them, but not because of that request, Lord chose to show them. But nobody has told Lord to show them. Even those who are so close to Lord, like Sanat Kumara, so the great devotees, even they never had the privilege of seeing the cosmic form. And I am here asking him to show the cosmic form. Do I really deserve it? Manya chakyam maya dashtamidi praho. Lord, if you think that I deserve it, then show me. Gives him a certain amount of freedom to Lord. <laughs> but look at him, Lord Krishna. Yes, he was just waiting. Hey Partha, look at my forms in thou hundreds and thousands. He was as eager to show him the cosmic form. <clears throat> the eleventh chapter is the cosmic form of the Lord. Arjuna is blessed one to see the cosmic form, to see the Lord as a self of all, as a self of the whole cosmos. But then what happens? Slowly and slowly that form changes, transforms itself into a very frightening form. He sees nothing but the manifestation of death, as though here is someone who is ready to devour. In fact, he sees the whole universe being devoured, all these beings entering the jaws of the death, entering, you know, the mouth of the Lord, and he is quietly masticating them. He sees the Pandavas all lined up and entering into the jaws of the Lord and he is masticating them. He was frightened. He says, what is it? How come you appear before me in this form? And so, Arjuna says, Akhya himeko bhavan ugra rupa hai. Ugra rupa hai. Why have you appeared in this, this frightening form? Namastu te deva prasida. I, 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 I supplicate to you, I surrender to you, I, I bow down to you. Please tell me, what's the purpose why you appeared in this form? Then Lord Krishna says, 
I am appeared before you as the nothing but embodiment of death because I am going to devour all these two armies of Kauravas and Pandavas. And thus the idea is a cosmic form is shown. <coughs> At the end of this, the cosmic form, the Lord Krishna says, as to, hey Arjuna, you are the most, one of the most blessed ones. Nobody can see this form of mind unless they have that devotion. An bhaktya tvananya shakya aham evam vidha Arjuna. Hey Arjuna, only the one who possesses ananya bhakti, who possesses unparalleled devotion, who possesses single-pointed devotion, by that devotee I can be seen. How to become that devotee? That formula is given by the Lord in the last verse of the 11th chapter also. How do you become the devotee? Mat karmakrit, mat paramaha, mat bhaktaha, sangavarjitaha, nirvairaha, sarabhuteshu, yasamame di pandava. He says five things. Next class, mat karmakrit. One who performs actions for my sake. Mat paramaha, one for whom I am the ultimate goal. Mat bhaktaha, one who is devoted to me. Sangha varjita, one who is free from all the attachments everywhere else. Nirvairaha sarabhuteshu, one who entertains no enmity to any beings. Yaha, a devotee like that, maam eti, he definitely reaches me. And with that, the 11th chapter is the background of the 12th chapter. Because as we see, the 12th chapter opens with the question of Arjuna. And why does Arjuna frame the question the way he does? Why does the question arise and why the question frame the way it is framed has this background of what has gone before? You know, in what the Lord Krishna what Lord Krishna has described until this point. So this is the background of this twelfth chapter and we'll continue the discussion from the next class. Om Puranamada Puranamidam Puranat Puranamudachade Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyade Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Vadashya Krutau Vande Bhagavantau Punapunaha Ishvaro Guru Ratmedi Murti Veda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadhyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha